And uh, I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar on vector symbolic architectures. And it's my huge pleasure to welcome Mikhail Hersher, who uh, is the speaker uh, today. Well, he will introduce the title of his talk himself. So uh, everybody, so welcome, Mikhail. Okay, thanks a lot. So let me share the screen. All right, so I assume you can see the screen and my laser pointer? Yes. Okay, all right. So yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. I will uh, present a work which is called Near Channel Classifier, Symbiotic Communication and Classification in High Dimensional Space. So this work was done in co collaboration and between ETH Zurich and IBM also in Zurich and got also recently published in Brain Informatics Journal. So let's first have a look at the commonly used communication system. So normally we just get an input data stream, which we want to um, transmit over a certain channel. So on the sender side, we first have the source coding, channel coding, which basically do the compression of the data, add again some redundancy to get robust rep representation. We do the modulation um, and feed it into the power amplifier. And then we can send this data over a noisy channel. And then on the receiver side, we have the low noise amplifier demodulation and then the corresponding decoding steps. And if we look at a base station of an LTE system and look at the power distribution of the corresponding blocks, we see that if we want to cover a large area, for example, a radius of one kilometers, we see that most of the energy or power is consumed by this power amplifier and all the other um, blocks don't consume that um, large share of power. However, if you want to cover a smaller area, for example, a femtocell that covers just 10 meters of radius, the story changes. So in this case, um, it's not the power amplifier that dominates the power consumption. However, we see all of a sudden that, for example, the channel coding um, requires a large share of the, of the power for doing the encoding and especially the decoding. So therefore, there is need for um, efficient and computationally cheap codes um, that require low computational complexity. And in this work, we analyze the role of high dimensional computing in communication systems. So basically what we do is we have our input data and encode it directly to the high dimensional space where we can send it over a noisy channel and then on the receiver side, apply an iterative decoding to retrieve the transmitted data. In addition to this standard data transmission mode, we also provide a classification mode um, that basically operates directly at the input of, of the receiver. So we can directly sense the, the transmitted signal and do the classification on that transmitted signal without changing between different representations back and forth. So let's first have a look at the general encoding and decoding in HTC-based communication systems. So the use of high-dimensional or hyperdimensional computing in communication is actually not new. So there is a work called hyperdimension modulation. And this was already also presented in one of these seminars here at the VSA. And what we do basically, or what they do is that we have a certain number of information bits that we first encode to a sparse vector using position modulation and phase shift key modulation. And this sparse vector is then fed into a fast Fourier transform or FFT in order to sparse it and in order to distribute the energy from this sparse vector. Afterwards, we permute it and we find a permutation and we can do multiple of those encodings, namely V times, and superimpose all those vectors together. Um, of importance here is that 
um, like the encoding itself is the same for all the blocks, but the permutation is unique per block. On the receiver side, and then and basically this, this transmitted vector is, is complex valued, hence we call it here complex HDM. And this received complex uh, vector can then be decoded by first applying the inverse permutation and an IFFT um, in order then to demodulate um, this vector to get the corresponding um, indices of the position modulation and the, the phase shift gain modulation. Um, we can also feed this um, estimation back, do the reconstruction in order to do a successive interference calculation. I will come back to that uh, later a bit more in detail. And it has been shown that with this approach, um, we achieve a lower decoding complexity than state-of-the-art codes, such as a polar code at um, ISO coding gain. And what we propose in this work is an um, integer HDM. Um, and the basic building block of integer HDM is a bipolar random item memory. So we don't use the fast Fourier transform for encoding, but a bipolar random item memory. And we add further encoding steps, which are a vector rotation and sign modulation to further increase the coding rate while keeping the um, memory footprint of the encoding the same. Also in this case, we do the superposition of and V vectors and transmit in this case integer valued vectors. The decoding is built around the associative memory search, um, which is um, can be um, computationally efficient and implemented, for example, in the computational memory. Um, we have an, an advanced um, iterative decoding with improved successive interference cancellation, and this decoder can also be and quantized for reduced computational complexity. So let's first have a look at the problem definition. So um, our encoding problem can be posed as follows. So um, we have an input string U that has K bits and we map those K bits to a D dimensional vector that has integer values. And this vector is then sent over this noisy channel. In our case, we model it as an additive white Gaussian noise channel or EWGM channel. And then on the receiver side, we have the integer HDM decoder that predicts us basically the actual information bits you had. Um, overall, we define the throughput rate as the number of information bits per real valued channel usage. So in this case, it's K divided by D. And we are interested to get a, as high coding rate as possible while still having a robust code and that operates nicely in this noisy channel and allows for successful retrieval of the information you had. So let's have a look at the integer um, HDM encoding. So as I already said, the central building block is an uh, item memory. And um, in, our, in our case, we have um, n elements, uh, um, whereas each element is a d-dimensional random vector. So all of the, of the elements in our bipolar item memory are quasi-orthogonal. And to encode, we get a certain input bit string. In this case, it's a two, two bit input bit string. It is mapped to an integer index, in this case, two. We access the corresponding item, item in the item memory, and this is our encoded vector. This gives us a throughput rate of log two of n divided by d. So if we want to increase our throughput rate, we would need to exponentially increase the size of the item memory. Hence, we need further encoding steps um, where we can keep the size of the item memory the same, but still achieve higher throughput rate. One way to do that is to have a cyclic rotation in addition to the item memory. So we still have the item memory encoding that gives us a certain vector. And then we can use additional or encode additional bits. In this case, it's three bits 
that we can map to a, an index, a rotation index R, which is one in this case, and we simply cyclically rotate our vector that gives us yet another quasi orthogonal vector that can be sent over the air. This um, cyclic rotation increases the throughput rate by log d divided by d. And as a last step, we add a sign modulation. And um, so we still have our um, five bits that we had before that we can use for the item memory access as well as the rotation encoding. And then we can use yet another bit to map it to a sign value, one or minus one, and apply the element wise multiplication with this vector to get yet another orthogonal vector. So this overall gives um, us uh, yet another bit that we can encode into our um, system without increasing the size of the item memory. As a last step, we do the superposition of multiple of those encoded vectors. So we have an input bit string u that we divide into substrings u1 to uv. And then um, we, for all the cases we use, for all the blocks, we use the same item memory, apply the rotation and the sign modulation. And then we apply a unique random permutation. And in this case, it's really a fully random permutation, not just a cyclic shift. And then those vectors can all be superimposed and sent over the channel. Let's get to the decoding. As I already mentioned in the beginning, our decoding is built around the associative memory searches. So essentially, we simply inversely permute our um, received vector for a given block V and can do the associative memory search to get the estimates of the item memory index, of the rotation index, and the sign modulation index. This um, associative memory search can be described as a bunch of inner products. So we compute the similarity for each of the um, item memory index and the rotation index by computing this inner product between the corresponding item and the rot rotated value of this um, y. And the eventual um, estimation is, is then simply by taking the argmax um, over all the possible um, item indexes and rotation indices. And the sign is just by looking at what sign the, the maximizing value had, because here we take the absolute value. So using this um, bipolar associative memory searches can bring some benefits. So for example, um, as we have a bipolar associative memory, we only need additions and subtractions um, due to our bipolar dictionary. And it's also possible um, to deploy this um, associative memory search on a computational memory, for example, on a phase change memory in constant time, as it has been shown in this related work. Um, on the other side, um, we had the IFFT-based searches in complex HDM, and this one requires, requires full precision computation, and also the complexity grows with the dimension. And therefore, like this was especially designed for um, dimensions at around 256, whereas our approach um, can be scaled to larger dimensions without any problem. So um, as a last step, we do the iterative decoding as it was also proposed in the complex HDM. So we, we do the estimation of, of our indices for item index, rotation and sign. And we use those estimations to do a, a reconstruction of the vectors X hat and we can use those to apply successive interference cancellation. So in the case for the next estimation and the next query of, of the first block, we simply subtract all the current estimated vectors, but the one we are using. So we're subtracting um, X2 until XV from the input vector, which gives us a, basically a denoised version that can be fed into the estimation again. And we do this decoding um, until convergence um, or until a maximum number of iterations is um, 
achieved. So regarding our simulation scenario, um, we, we, as I said, we do Monte Carlo um, simulation with K bits, and we have an AWGN channel with a variance one over SNR times ID. And we have our figure of merit, which is the bit error rate. So we measure this, that the bit error rate between the estimate that you had and you, and we, we use the energy per information bit per noise floor EB20, which is in the case of real valued channel uses and the signal to noise ratio divided by 2R. Regarding our integer HDM configuration, we use a dimension of 512. Um, also, the item memory size is 512. We superimpose seven vectors, which gives us a coding rate of 0 0.2598. We also did experiments with larger code rates, and we have seen that we can support code rates until um, one third with still reasonable performance. Um, but we couldn't go higher because at some point you see that the superposition and the retrieval from superposition starts to degrade. Regarding um, our baseline com com comparison, we compare it to complex HDM and polar codes with throughput rate R equals to one fourth um, for um, having baselines. Um, for the complex HDM, and um, we take the results that are reported in their paper. Um, they have a dimension of 256 complex valued vectors, which means they use the channel also 512 times. Hence, um, this is a one-to-one -one comparison we do. So they also have a code throughput of R equals to one fourth with our definition of the code throughput. Regarding the polar code, we use um, the polar code from the 5G new radio downlink configuration. Also in this case, um, 512 dimension, and the rate is also one fourth. This um, polar code configuration is different than the one used in the complex HDM. So they used a polar code with dimension 256 and rate one half. This yields the same EB20 behavior, but the code rate that is required with this polar code is, high, um, is higher um, than in our case. And we simply want to compare cases with the same number of information bits that are transmitted and the same number of channel uses. Therefore, we use this um, polar code configuration. So in this slide, we see the um, on the y axis the bit error rate and and the x axis the eb20 so the hard and um, this eb20 can be viewed as kind of an snr so the higher the snr the lower the bit error rate we see that our integer hdm works on par with the complex hdm and however we still fall short compared to the polar code. So this is around one dB of loss. And if we look at the same bit error rate. And so there is still need for improvements of HDM. And one way is to improve the decoding and mostly the feedback of the decoding in our feedback decoder. So one problem this feedback decoder could have or has actually is that if we make an estimation here and this estimation is wrong and we do the reconstruction based on this wrong estimation and if we simply feed it back we actually decrease the signal to interference ratio instead of increasing it and if we have multiple of those, those wrong estimations we cannot converge and one way is to take the confidence of this estimation here into account. And um, the measure of confidence we use in this work is simply at looking at the maximizing similarity and limit it to, be, to have values between zero and one. And we use this confidence and um, scale it with the estimate vector in order to feed it back. So estimations with, with low confidence are not used that strong for feedback, whereas like um, confident estimations are used um, just as they are essentially. 
and this really um, improves our um, performance. So we see that here now in blue, our um, soft feedback decoder um, gets a gain of around 0 0.2 dB compared to the standard feedback decoder. However, we are still um, short and um, like, um, lose a bit in performance compared to the polar code. And our feedback decoder can also be quantized. This is what we show in this slide. So we see in blue the performance of the, the feedback decoder in floating point arithmetic. And if we um, quantize it to fixed point, for example, 4.1, so simply one fractional bit is sufficient to achieve the same code um, performance as with, with the floating point. So, um, so far we have shown that we can use this HTC based encoding um, for transmitting um, data. And we have seen that our iterative feedback decoder is quite powerful to achieve good performance. And therefore we were also interested to see like what is actually the additive capacity of our system. So how many vectors can we superimpose and decode reliably? And so in this case, we compare two different readout options. So the one we have already seen is the associative memory readout. Here, we simply and um, inversely permute the, the, the vector X and then multiply it with this associative memory um, E, which is the same as, as the item memory before. And then the estimate is simply the argmax. And in this case, we do not use any rotational or um, sign modulation encoding. Um, an alternative which was proposed in, in this related work um, is based on the minimum mean squared error. So instead of doing the inverse permutation and using the associative memory, we use a completely new matrix F. And this F is, is um, basically separate per superposed vector. And we can learn this F um, by showing um, examples of superpositions X with the corresponding ground truth vectors and try to minimize this um, L2 or the minimum M, the mean squared error, for example, with SGD based minimization of the MSCD. So um, regarding our setup, we um, only do item memory encoding, as I already said. We use the same dimension as in the related work, meaning D equals to 500, and we vary the item memory size between 5 and 100. We measure then the probability of correct retrieval and then derive the operational capacity in bits per dimension, as reported here in this formula. So on this slide, we see the accuracy um, dependent on the number of superposed vectors for an item memory of five. And first of all, we see for the associative memory search, we achieve only around 20, and we can only retrieve around 20 vectors reliably. Whereas with the MMSE-based approach, and we can increase it to up to 150 vectors that we can reliably um, retrieve from our superposition. If you use now our feedback decoder, either units feedback or the soft feedback, we see that this um, number of retrieval vectors when using the associative memory can increase by 88 vectors. Here we don't see such a big difference between the unit feedback and the soft feedback. This will then be more accentuated in, in larger item memory sizes. And if we plug in the MMSE with the unit feedback, we see that the number of retrievable vectors can be increased by 116. So we can retrieve more than 250 vectors from this 500 dimensional representation with an item memory size of five. Here in this chart, we see again the accuracy versus the number of superposed vectors as we had before. And on the chart below, we see the capacity in bits per dimension. And we see that we could increase the operational capacity um, of around 0 0.7 before with the MMSE to more than 1.2 bits. 
And similar trends have all, can also be seen in, in, in the other chart, where we have um, an item memory size of 100. In this case, we don't see that much of a gain when using the MMSE feedback and MMSE readout instead of using the associative memory. Therefore, also in the general integer HDM, we simply used associative memory. And um, we see that here in this case, the soft feedback slightly performs better than the unit feedback and also achieves the highest operational capacity. So as a last step, we add yet another block to, to our system, and namely the classification. So in, in this part, we, we um, apply our HDC encoding and, and the, the classification on a, an EMG-based gesture recognition. So normally, um, a communication system in, in, in connection with a ML system normally looks like that. So we have our sensor data, normally you do some feature extraction to use the dimensionality of your data. You do the source coding and go all the way um, to the source decoding and then apply the classification. And what we propose is to use a, a unified representation in the sense of high dimensional computing, where we have simply a HDC encoding and this HSC encoding can then be used um, uh, for sending it over the air and then doing the near channel classification on the other end. Combining classification um, with communication in the, the realm of um, high dimensional computing was also used in other works. So we have the collective communication for dense sensing environments or a dependable, dependable MAC layer architecture based on holographic data representation. So as I already said, we do the EMG-based gesture recognition use case with this near channel classification. So we start with um, an input data um, that has 64 channels, temporal, temporal input data that is um, encoded with commonly used um, spatial and temporal encoders. So we quantize our features we map those quantized features using the continuous item memory, use a specific rotation per channel, do the spatial superposition, do a clipping, and then the five gram computation, which gives us a binary vector that can be sent over the air and classified using an associative memory search. And in this case, we use a gesture recognition with five different classes. The code throughput we achieve here is the 64 channels times the seven bits, which come from the quantization, we quantize it to seven bits, and then the five gram encoding we have here divided by D. So in this slide, we show the average classification accuracy versus the signal to noise ratio. First of all, we see that when increasing the dimension from 512 to 10,000, we can increase and the, the accuracy in high SNR regimes. However, this increase some, somehow saturates from the dimension at dimension 2K. This dimension 2K is interesting anyways, since in this case, we have a code throughput rate of around one. So we do actually not add any redundancy to, to our code. However, we see that this representation is still robust against additive byte Gaussian noise and we are able to still retain a high um, classification accuracy of above 90%, even in SNR regimes below zero dB. Um, as a second um, um, experiment, we can also quantize our associative memory readout. So the associative memory itself is bipolar anyways, but in this case, with the dashed lines, we also quantize the query vector that um, we sent into the associative memory search. And this performs well in high SNR regimes. As we go to lower SNR regimes, we see some degradation in the classification performance. And in this experiment, we not only add additive white Gaussian noise, but we also consider um, an experiment where multiple nodes transmit at the same time. Each of the nodes 
um, has its unique continuous item memory and unique um, random permutations in order to have orthogonal codes. And when all of those nodes operate at the same time, we are still able to achieve a good performance. So if you look, for example, at the case with six nodes, we are still able to um, get an accuracy of around um, 90% while um, all the nodes um, perform at the same time. So far, we just showed the classification uh, mode of, of our system, um, but it also features a reconstruction um, mode. So in this case, we simply bypass the five gram computation and send the spatial um, signal here, XT, um, over the air and can and are and we are able to to reliably decode it with our interactive HDM decoder. So having the ability to still having access to the data can be quite useful, especially in medical applications where we need and um, to have interpretable models. So in this slide, we show the mean squared error of the reconstruction versus the signal to noise ratio. And we see first the decoding with just a standard associative memory search. And as we increase the dimension, we can improve the mean squared error. Um, but it's not the only way to in, um, improve the mean squared error. We can also just use the soft feedback decoder instead. And, and if you look at some, some specific um, operational points, we see that um, when we use the, the soft feedback decoder, we can essentially um, divide the dimension by two um, when we compare it to the associative memory. And this is um, can be seen in different operation points and with different dimensions. And moreover, like in, in this slide, we show um, the actual reconstructed signal. And um, on the blue is the original features and for different um, tasks of this um, gesture recognition experiment. And we see in blue the original features, in red the soft feedback estimation, and in green, the associative memory estimation. And it's, it's quite clear that our soft feedback estimation follows the original features much more accurately than just the standard associative memory estimation. In this case, dimension D of 1K was used and the SNR, SNR is 5 dB. So to summarize, we propose integer HDM. Um, if R equals to one fourth, that achieves the same coding gain as complex HDM. And um, while we exclusively um, depend on bipolar codes and only transmit integer valued vectors, then we have a new soft feedback decoder that can improve the coding gain by 0 0.2 dB. And um, we also conducted experiments where we um, just have a noiseless and capacity experiments where we achieve. 1.2 bits per dimension with our um, representation and decoder. And then we propose a near channel classifier that shows great robustness against noise. And, and finally, we show that with our EMG feature reconstruction system, our soft decoder can reduce the necessary dimension by up to two times and while having the same mean squared errors. Yeah, if that, um, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, okay, any questions from the audience? Maybe, maybe I, I can start with mine. Uh, so I see Daniel uh, switched on his camera. I, I know he has question, questions. Lots of them, but uh, <laughs> um, just to, to uh, clarify for myself uh, one, one issue, uh, I mean, how do you actually transmit uh, integer valued vectors over the air? I mean, what kind of modulation scheme you use? I mean, what would you use? Yeah, you can basically use amplitude modulation. So as, as you use, um, so it's it's kind of a a, a BPSK um, with amplitude modulation, um, mm -hmm. but essentially 
um, the same holds for for the complex HDM or oh, like if you consider systems that use OFDM there you also um, transmit basically real valued um, signals right or like com like two uh, two real valued signals that that are like with I I channel and Q channel right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well okay so. but of course but of course um, the, if we would be able to to transmit them, um, binary signals would be beneficial, right? But mm. but the issue there is that then we cannot apply our feedback decoder anymore. As if, if we would clip, we also did experiments where we clipped um, the signal before doing the transmission. Um, mm. But but then um, we cannot apply our feedback decoder, and the feedback decoder is really essential to achieve this this um, FEM like performance. All right. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Michael, I had a question about the comparison when you were comparing the color codes, the HDM, and the yeah. integer HDM. And so there, I, I, I've read it in the paper, but I didn't fully get the argument. So, so I think in HDM, so the efficiency is over you divide by two R. And then in polar codes, the efficiency you divide it over R, right? And and that I didn't fully get that that moment just because it, it sounds so, like yeah. those just using I and Q channels. No, the, so the, is, the, the polar code uses just it uses BPSK, right? So mm -hmm. just that the real value channel. And um, what we are interested in is as like um, like all all of the comparison um, in terms of spectral efficiency holds between the complex HDM here and the polar code. So this is this is this is this holds perfectly fine. The problem is rather um, about the the code throughput. So um, if we simply because we in our case we could also and um, simply use the Q channel as well, right? And then um, have a, a dimension of, of 1K, right? And then we also could um, claim a code rate of one half. That's a bit the problem. So the polar code just uses BPSK, whereas the complex HDM uses QPSK or uh, the, the Q channel as well. I see. Okay, but that then, okay. But then if the... So following that logic, so if the polar code would use QPSK, then you would say that rate is one over, over four, right? In this case, yes, yeah. Oh wait, oh, the, but okay, but then it's like two bits per symbol. Then yeah, exactly. Still, yeah. yeah, I see. But it, this is a bit uh, a problem, like um, normally you have kind of the code rate, right? And then you have your modulation rate. Um, but in 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 in, in HDM, you, you basically combine the modulation and and the the error correcting codes together, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what what um, mixes things a bit up. I, would say. I see. Have you done any experiments uh, like in the opposite way, as you suggested that instead of saying that the HDM throughput is R one over four? Is just assuming that you now can use both I and Q channels, and so you can transmit like two of your integer values um, over over one channel use. That I, that kind no, of no, I haven't. No, I haven't. No. Yeah, because in a way, like I guess, like kind of both channels are, are in a way there. So why, like, why? Yeah, not, that's that's true. Why not to use that's, it? Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. There. But no, we haven't. Mm -hmm. I have a few, uh, at least one more question, if, but if, I would ask it if no one else is interested in asking another question. So, so let's uh, let's see, uh, are there anybody else who, who wants to ask a question here? So, no hands rising yet. I don't see anybody unmuted them, themselves. So then you shoot. Um, th that was related to, I think, slide like 28 or 27, where you were showing the, the information, if 
patient said thing. And uh, the, cap no. the capacity experiment. The cap yeah, um, yeah. So, so yeah, that 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 one. So, so the one with R. No, I think it was like 20, 27 or twenty eight. Uh, this one, right? Yeah. So this one, uh, uh, but that was just a speculation. So when you say that uh, R value equals to one, so this kind of figure suggests that that you send about. 2000 bit of information let's say right yes exactly yeah. and i was like you know thinking just kind of playing the devil's advocate thinking that when we solve the classification problem i mean the probably like the amount of information we send is is just is just a class label in a, in a way Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So I, I was just thinking that, like, you know, if, if you have four classes or like 16 classes of gestures, that, that it means that a data sample actually can, contains four bits of information, like from the classification point of view. So I'm not saying that, that it doesn't contain more information, but like purely from the classification point of view, it's probably only four bits yes. of information. Yes. Um, yes. I, 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 do, I do agree with this point. Um, but it, this, this study was rather like a, as a starting point. Of course, we were also interested in, in applications with more classes, especially, and this would be also a next step because there are also EMG data sets with, with more like 20 classes and this one recent one uh, where you can increase, increase this. And what, what you can also argue about is that maybe um, your associative memory classification can be something different, more complex that can not be um, de deployed onto the sensing node. This would be also an application where this, this um, transmission of, of the encoded vectors would be of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, yeah def, I'm not questioning the motivation for sure. I, I was just more like that. Yeah, this I, number, I, agree, I agree with that point. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. It's a little tricky, like to make an argument about this number. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, I want to let people from the audience again to ask questions. Let's wait. Well, if not, then uh, I would like to thank Michael once again yeah, thank you. Uh, for presenting uh, this uh, very interesting work. And uh, I would like to remind uh, all people in the audience that uh, in two weeks from now, we uh, will return somehow to the topic of functional representations. Uh, and uh, we will be talking about um, neural field representations. So they will be talked by uh, Yulia Sandamirskaya. So uh, stay tuned. And if you have uh, an interesting material to present, please uh, send, uh, uh, drop a line to me. So we will schedule, find a slot for your talk. Thank you very much for today and uh, have a great week, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.